<laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Inquisitor podcast. Today, my guest is Sunil Kumar. You may have been listening to some of uh, our ramblings in the green room. And what we're going to talk about is different approach to how you develop people. Sunil and his partner have set up a company called Trainio. And what they do is they train people at their own expense, no cost to the, uh, the people there themselves. And they get trained up and then they find jobs for them. And it's a model that has worked many times in the past. But what I really like is the difference in the way uh, Sunil is thinking about his role as a manager and as a leader. So Sunil, welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Really appreciate you having me on, Marcus. Can you tell everyone a little bit about your journey so far? Yeah, absolutely. So I have ADHD and dyslexia. So I went to school and I had an impression of myself, which I was a stupid child, not as smart as the other children around me, and um, always aspired to be a smart person and wasn't really sure of the how. And I think that was very environmental. I didn't know that I was neurodiverse at the time. So it's kind of a long period of figuring things out, figuring out how my brain works. Can you just um, explain what neurodiverse means for those old people who don't know? Yeah, absolutely. So a neurodiverse person is someone that would think differently to the average by the normal people by the average, right? So autism is a form of neurodiversity. Dyslexia is. ADHD is. Many different forms that I'm not too aware of. Um, ADHD and dyslexia, I'm pretty read up on because those are the ones that affect me. Understood. Okay, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to make sure people actually understand because I think for certainly a lot of the older people in my audience, me included, things have moved on very quickly. And I'm uh, just trying to... There's a lot of new words, right? <laughs> Again, one of the really interesting things here is we seem to spend so much time looking for reasons to be offended or upset and looking for reasons, uh, looking for difference. And in my dotage, I've started to realise how important it is to look for similarities, look for what we have in common and to build bridges. And my life has become infinitely easier since I have. And I realized just how much energy I must have exerted in the past getting in my own way. So you're talking about empathy, right? The action uh, of it? Or? Empathy is part of it. But I think a, a realization that you can be satisfied, there can be enough. And my, con my contribution gives me greater satisfaction than what I take out interestingly enough. And the older and more experienced I get, the more important that becomes to me. Well, it's like when you give a great gift. Sometimes yeah. you get more joy than receiving one, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, any day. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So tell me this. To, to explain a little bit about what Trainio does, first of all, because uh, I love the concept. So Trainio is an SDR boot camp. Um, we take people from all backgrounds. So from an 18 year old who decided that university wasn't for them or just wasn't an option in the first place to um, a 45 year old professor with two, uh, two PhDs um, and decided they wanted to move out of academia. Those are two real candidates that we've placed. 85% of the people we help are typically um, close to or minimum wage. Um, so they are looking and hungry for an opportunity to improve their lives, the lives of those around them their dependents, their family, and um, are just not sure of how or maybe haven't been given the right environment in the past. So that's what we do at Trainio. We partner with industry leaders, uh, many of which you know. I know Najda featured on this podcast recently, and she's also one of our guest speakers now and advisors. So we have people who are considered experts in what they know come in and teach what's working for them in today's world from their perspective. And after that eight weeks, you take someone who was probably unconfident, maybe was unsure of how to articulate themselves in a professional environment to a polished candidate who's been trained in the entry-level role of SDR for SAS. Um, and it's really remarkable, the results we've been seeing. So what, what's the purpose behind this? Because it does sound like there is some form of mission and purpose behind uh, the, the yeah. business itself. So you're quite right. It's completely purpose-driven. This business has been born out of something you said when we were rambling, understanding the problems, um, understanding the problems firsthand. So myself and Omar mentioned I didn't go to university. Omar dropped out. It wasn't for him. And we met in recruitment. We fell into recruitment like a lot of people do. 
and Omar took me under his wing. I was like 19 years old at the time. I didn't really know a lot. I didn't also didn't have much of a work ethic. And he said, hey, this is how to pick up a phone. This is how to work hard. And we became good friends. We were recruiting automotive professionals during Brexit and we had a really tough, humbling year. Okay. So <laughs> I didn't have any money whatsoever, just, just my baby. <laughs> and I was also a loss to the company, I'm sure. So Omar spotted a sector called SaaS and he said, well, so no, it's grown 400% this year despite Brexit. And people would be recruiting as salespeople. They're kind of similar to us and it could be a lot of fun. So I said, fine. And we went and we started recruiting SaaS professionals. And we were recruiting predominantly AEs and sales directors because that's where the highest margins could be achieved. But we knew that we could probably do the SDR role um, if we were given the opportunity. And then one day maybe become AEs or so on and so on. So six months in after having success in recruiting SaaS, both of us tried to transition over to that side. And we applied to recruitment companies in the space and the three most popular and biggest SDR recruiters at the time. And we received rejection. Well, we didn't even receive any emails, no emails at all, just radio silence. And then we applied to companies directly on the website through LinkedIn, easy apply. And again, very little response, sometimes automated rejection from HR. And what we noticed was significant biases in one, looking for people from non-typical backgrounds and two on degrees so most of the jobs 90 percent of the jobs at the time required bachelor degrees the way we got around that was by doing research on what an sdr hiring manager would be interested in seeing from their candidate so we started picking up the phones and we cold called sdr hiring managers the person i cold called was alistair henderson who i think you met or may have met recently and uh he said hey yeah I like the sound of how you go about it do you want a job optimizely? And I landed at a great SaaS company um, that was Series D at the time and their market leader had already achieved product market fit. Um, and Omar landed at a similar company, I think Series B, Series C. And we both became globally top performing SDRs. So at that point, we felt like we deserved to be in a room and we've proven something to ourselves. If I fast forward to sort of my two years in SaaS, I was an SDR hiring manager. Before that, I failed as an AE. Then I also started consulting with small startups and building teams. What I noticed throughout that process is that onboarding is wildly inconsistent. Some mm. companies have it great, some companies not so great. And I'm sure you're nodding and, and, and smirking, so you can obviously relate. <laughs> well, it's a pain smirk. Yeah. Because that first 120 days are when the new hire is putting the job, the manager, mm. the company, and the customers on probation. And they're deciding, yeah. have I made a terrible decision? Is my boss a total ass? Do I like the people I'm working with? Can I sell this stuff? Do I want to sell this stuff? Do I like the customers? Do I like the people I'm working with? Was I better off somewhere else? Will I be better off somewhere else? Which is why something like 42% of people leave within 30 days of hiring. Wow. Uh, or maybe it's 30% within 42 days, but it's still a bloody terrifying statistic. What a waste. Yeah, yeah. So it's just a huge amount of time, right? huge amount it's of time insane. yeah obviously you can relate to that and i i saw onboarding them really well when i was consulting and, and part of that um delivery mechanism we, we had a really good process and i learned from a really credible cro but when i landed in my first sdr role there was no onboarding and i'd never been in SaaS before so i had a really painful three months figuring things out but we got there right and, and i thought maybe it could have been done better so during the pandemic before i ventured into sdr leadership um, I failed as an AE. I was an SDR for 10 months. And I took a role as an enterprise AE. I took the role for the most money I could find. Um, and I ignored some really credible advice. And I was 23 years old and I was on 60K basic and a 60K OTE, which was quite achievable if I had put the work in and been in the right environment. So I'd achieved my dream, so to speak, right? That's what I thought I had done. And I didn't pass probation and it ended March 2020. So <laughs> that was like a really tough time right um pandemic hiring freeze biggest ever recession supposedly around the corner and i saw this rhetoric on linkedin saying it's going to be really tough to get a job now so i went into panic mode and i kind of cried for two months and just kept thought about what i wanted to do next if i wasn't going to be an AE. I got myself up and i thought well i want to be an sdr leader i was really good at that and i was kind of the silent leader within my old team a lot of people would rely on me for advice and I could see myself doing that full time. So I started cold calling hiring managers. 
within one week of prospecting, I had 10 interviews and one company moved really quickly that I got to know and really enjoyed the idea of working for um, and landed myself a role. So at that point, I thought, well, maybe I can help a bunch of people on LinkedIn because it's not too clear uh, how to get a job right now, but it is quite simple if you have... You know, right, so you're not only training them how to be a SaaS SDR, but you're te teaching them how to prospect for a job. Yes. Love it. Yeah. So they're actually doing the job that they're demonstrating, yeah. so they're demonstrating their capability. I I've been teaching this to my clients for about 15 years. It's so beautiful to see it in action. I'm, I'm delighted. This is fantastic. I love to hear that. It's something that you don't see enough of even today, no. and it's well, so I mean, simple to do. <laughs> but think about it. The advertised market is full of competition and you have to go through recruiters and HR yes. and all of the bureaucracy. And if you don't tick the box, there's nothing. Well, why yeah. not ply your trade and do the job and exactly. prove to them that you are a better investment than the 20% that they're going to fire anyway? They've got the budget. It's just a matter of replacing the people that they're going to, you know, if you're going to be entirely callous about it, do that. But yeah demonstrate real value as an SDR to a manager who needs an SDR because he needs pipeline or she needs pipeline. No, I, I couldn't agree more. It seems so logical and obvious, but for some reason it isn't, right? <laughs> so so I, I, I started doing that during 2020. Um, I wasn't employed to do it. It wasn't my job. I didn't have a business at the time, but I just wanted to help people who were unemployed. And by the end of that year, I placed 16 people in SDR roles for free. And four of those people were from US boot camps. And I had been planning to build a boot camp since 2019, since I got into the space. I just saw the opportunity then popping up in San Francisco. And I thought, well, there's a huge population of SDRs there anyway. We could really do with something like this in EMEA. At the time, there weren't any in EMEA. So I had a Google Doc just sitting around. And this was my first kind of time to test out some ideas that, that, that I had, some theories that I had. And when I got to meet the US candidates, I actually featured on a US boot camps podcast. And um, I got a lot of them come and approach me and they said, hey, we've paid $10,000 for this course and we haven't got a job. I placed them, right? I placed all of them, um, all of the ones that approached me. Um, so four out of four. That was really telling because I looked on these websites and they preach diversity and inclusion. I once admired these companies and I realized, hey, they're just repping diversity and inclusion for profit. And the inclusion they have is, rich people who are diverse. They are not helping people who can't afford it. So I thought we could do this in a much better way. I, I have a recruitment background. I know if you have, can find good candidates, you can charge a significant fee and be a profitable company. You don't have to tie people into a $30,000, which most of the companies do, a $30,000 income share agreement delivered by a loan shark type company. So they, those hired. organizations are really very tired. They, they, they do smack of real exploitation uh, oh, yeah. of people who are in dire need. And do you know those are the ones that have the most funding because it's a reoccurring revenue model? So I, I understand if you are making a, a real contribution, but my experience of people who have gone through those programs when they've tried to sell to me has been yeah. deeply disappointing as a buyer. Yeah. I've never felt safe. It always felt like I was being sold at. So I don't think they were going to be set up. I, I think that's a, a lot of money given away for very bad direction. It, it really was. So the candidates I spoke with had not received live training. They received pre-recorded training. It wasn't delivered by experts. I actually got into the platform myself and checked it out. It was really, really poor. I've checked out multiple platforms and... Ours is free and 10 times better. I mean, I wouldn't even say it's 10 times better because there's just, it's just not at a standard where I would compare it. Ours is at a standard where it is really credible and delivered by people who not only our customers trust, but the whole industry trust. Yeah. Right. Okay. So help me understand this then. There is a huge opportunity in my mind for organizations to take advantage of the fact that there are many people who are probably in their 40s, early 50s, and have sat on the buyer side of the desk. They've been operators. Now, I fundamentally believe it's easier to train those people how to sell than it is to train a 22-year-old to have a peer-to-peer -peer conversation with 
veteran CFO and to be able not only to hold their own, but to be relevant because they don't have the context. Yeah, you're 100% right. It's also just the experience of life, right? That's, That's what it is. And what I find in that is we've had a number of candidates that are over the age of 40 and even uh, further on in their careers. And they have been our most successful candidates consistently by the averages. We don't have as many. In terms of results? Yes, yeah. In terms of graduating top of the boot camp, being credible in interviews and not nervous and able to speak as a peer to the interview, exactly what you said, right? That's how they present. And, and, and they're also a lot of the times willing to work harder, more driven. And, and, and yeah, just their expectations are a lot closer to reality in a lot of cases. So uh, the disappointing thing with that, though, is we are a company that preaches diversity and inclusion. And a lot of SaaS companies work with us, a lot of major brands. And, and they work with us because they want to hire young, diverse candidates, right? But diversity we, and inclusion includes old people. It does. It completely does. And, I, and I, 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 that's a big part of what we need to educate, right? Because when we put a candidate in front of him who's graduated the boot camp top of his class, so Ben San, shout out to Ben, it took three months for us to get him a, a, a job. And he consistently got to final stage and then culture fit would come up. One of the most interesting observations, because I've done uh, quite a few podcasts around uh, D&I, um, and I, um, and the, the common theme is you're invited to the table, but you're not allowed to order from the menu. And when you do get to order, uh, you don't necessarily get quite what you expected. People hire for diversity and they fire for not fitting in. Or people leave because they just don't feel welcome. And I, I'm really curious because sales should be a meritocracy. And you know, we, we, we are measured on our results. So why is it? that we spend so much time with these intrinsic biases blocking people who have an, a massive intrinsic motivation. And instead, we hire people who have extrinsic motivation, which is largely to be seen to look good and not really produce. I, I'm, I'm it, flabbergasted. It, it, it's absolutely crazy. And it makes me think of something that's slightly related, right? So I was listening to a podcast Stephen Bartlett's podcast, which I really enjoy, he had the CEO of Monzo on it. And when they were founding Monzo, they had a team of um, people who weren't from the space, but were really credible and purpose-driven and had a mission. To get a banking license, they had to hire bigwigs from the banks. And as soon as that process started, poison started to seep into the business. And they started to change their culture and how they did things and why they were doing things. And that seems like society as a whole reinforced that, right? It wasn't something they were desired to do. It's something they had to do. Again, th- this raises some very, very interesting questions in terms of the future of selling. I'm really pondering these questions very deeply now because I can see at a meta level, there are some very big global trends, which we're not going to be able to do anything to fight against. So we've got to try and work out how we can capitalize on the changing circumstance and not end up with our fingers burned or worse. And the more I dig into this, the more I realize that people's perspective is limited by their ability to see into the future and uh, look beyond themselves. Because very often what we find, especially now, we're going to see more and more people moving into survival mode. And we're going to see more and more people looking for very prescriptive help. They're not going to want theoretical stuff. They're not going to want to look for the stuff in the future, which is the stuff that will save them. Yeah, it's sustainable, right? Um, They're looking for the short-term fix. We all know that's not really reasonable. (laughs) And so (laughs) what what we're seeing is um, that what I'm starting to see is uh, organizations are starting to realize that it wasn't that they grew their market share. What happened during the pandemic that you know, gave them the boost was their market expanded to accept their message. Now what's happening is that message is no longer relevant because people are now starting to hunker down. You know, I've had three or four conversations in the last two days where people are saying, 
that uh, the close ratios are um, starting to worsen. There's uh, longer sales cycles. Yeah, these are enterprises. What types of businesses are those? Uh, the, what, what they were all enterprise. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. So, yeah, and, they, and they were SaaS, they were SaaS as well, which was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, no, now, it is because I mean we service the ecosystem of SaaS and we're seeing continuous growth. I think I believe our message is right and will stay right, but I do sort of ask the question: When is this bubble on the SDR hiring market going to pop? Because it will at some. Yeah. At the moment, I, 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 maybe you can correct me because I heard a terrible statistic about a week ago, which is that there were eight vacancies for every applicant for sales on LinkedIn at the moment. Now. I, I would say that's very true. Yeah. Shift. Yeah. It's, really? It's def- well, I don't know if there's eight, but it's definitely a candidate driven market. No, we well, uh, absolutely. And so what interests me is yeah. as the escalation of the arms race within sales and marketing tech starts to drive, uh, I mean, they're, they're, um, Jay McBain released a, a, a graphic. There are 9,932 MarTech vendors as of Q1 2022. There's another 1,500 to 2,000 sales enablement platforms. There's CRM, there's PRM, there's marketing, there's all this stuff going on. And then you've got all the trainers, coaches, consultants, and advisors and everything else in a feeding frenzy in this marketplace. But what I'm really intrigued by is with that escalation in terms of the technology and the salary inflation that's going on, is it going to be affordable for many small organizations to even keep top of the funnel in-house? Well, that's why you're seeing outsourced sales development blow up right now, right? It's big in America. It's big in EMEA. Yeah, I, I think that's going to become more and more prominent because SDRs are fast becoming unaffordable. When we speak to clients, who are new to hiring SDRs in London, these generally aren't the ones we work with. Like, okay, well, we're prepared to pay £22,000 basic, £25,000 basic. And their yeah. expectations are not for an entry level. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah. <laughs> and even for an entry level SDR, you should be paying in London between 28 and 32 base. And that's the minimum we work to. But they're, a lot of them are looking for someone with experience. It's like, well, you just can't afford it. There's no way. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I do question what's going to happen. So if that is the case and it starts becoming unaffordable, how do you see that panning out then? Just you know, as a thought exercise, I'm curious. Yeah. How, how do you see that panning out? Uh, and uh, do you see people moving into ecosystems? That's certainly the way I think it's going to go. But I'm just really curious to get a, a sense of where you see it. I think there's going to be a lot of outsourced sales development. I also think a lot of it is expanding offshore at the moment. So I'm based in South America and I know of three successful outsourced sales development agencies that have hundreds of SDRs in Medellin or Bogota or Buenos Aires. And uh, they're doing really well in America at the moment. So I think you'll start to see what happened with manufacturing years ago. And, And quite honestly, I not sure. Um, I'm, 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 I'm excited to find out. <laughs> okay. So let, let's look in, uh, into the crystal ball a bit more, though, because I, I like doing this sort of thing. So in terms of how you are going to market, I'm really curious how much of that uh, business is driven by uh, is hot prospects as opposed to cold, first of all. So... By definition of hot, you would say they know us before. They, they know you. You're being introduced by someone who is known by both sides and trusted by both sides. 80% um, or, top business. How much? 80%. One eight. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. I mean, we outbound warm business, right? So we'll outbound yeah. them and we'll get in a room with them and they'll go, oh, I've seen Leon's content. I've seen Annika's content. I've seen your content love what you do that's typically the reaction we get in most of our meetings now we've managed to create this effect where we're doing over two hundred thousand views on linkedin across the team a week and it's a very small space it's a very small space so it doesn't take long for everyone to know who you are so again i'm really interested how you choreograph the communication and your content internally first of all so i have been someone who is what i thought had 
procrastinate. I would class it as procrastination on LinkedIn, probably two hours a day since I've started working. I've always been fascinated with however people build businesses, however people lead teams, marketing itself is a passion of mine, huge one. And I've followed leaders like um, Chris Walker at Refine Labs, Gong, Dooley, Mark P. Jung, all, all these people who have created really powerful word of mouth brands. And I've always aspired to do something similar. I've always thought that doesn't actually look that hard with the people I know and the skill sets they have and the age we live in. Maybe it would be possible. And Trainio was my first attempt at making it a reality. So I started to lead as I mean to go on, right? In order for the whole team to post, I had to start and show why we were posting. So I first started posting content on LinkedIn literally the day we launched. And I've consistently got over above 10,000 views on every post. And it's always been about why we're doing what we're doing. And it's always been, like you said, looking for similarities. The people who like my content like it because they can relate and empathize with it. Um, it's not alien to them. It's probably something they've been thinking and frustrated by. Um, and they see it and they're like, yes, that, right? Um, and that's the way we write all of our content. So we have a phrase inside of Trainio called Itsy. Because the whole idea is everyone lives a very similar life. And if you are able to share aspects of it that a lot of people don't, a lot of other people relate to it. So ITC means ITC is that content. So the idea is in a probation review, when someone calls up sick, that's all relatable, depending on who you're trying to appeal to. Oh. Um, if you put it out there, you can build per very powerful personal brands. So everyone has three content pillars. One of them is Trainio because we give you a day a week to build content. So you've got to talk about Trainio a little bit, unfortunately. The other two are completely personal to you. So 20% of their working time is spent developing content. They work four days a week and they don't spend a whole day producing content, probably half a day a week, realistically. Yeah. Okay. All our staff for four days a week, fully remote, and we've had amazing results. You can so work they talk day. about Trainio. What are the other two pillars? So I'll give you an example. Um, my pillars are marketing and building in the open and training. Liam's pillars are SDR because he's very passionate about sales and training and just his life, what goes on in his life. Matthew on our team, um, who is partially paralyzed, one of his key pillars is disability awareness and remote working and how disabled people can be the perfect SDRs. That's exactly what he wants to do at Trainio. That's his miniature mission. So all the pillars are, are very personal like paula who's colombian and language uh, spanish is her first language is writing content about she just wrote her first post i saw it last night and i was really really impressed and here you go talking about an ecosystem that's will at video who's part of our ecosystem posting about us we're posting about his technology we win together so where is it paula this is what paula wrote she said uh Recently, I began building my personal brand. As you know, as you all know, this starts with posting and engaging on LinkedIn. Being from Colombia, Spanish isn't my first language. All of my thoughts and ideas need to be translated to English, and this adds an extra hurdle for my content, writing, and engagement. And throughout this, if you're not, you can't see the video, she's got emojis making it more engaging, right, and more relatable to um, the market she's appealing to. And she's got a meme here of uh, a popular sitcom with a, with a woman saying, do you know how frustrating it is to translate everything in my head before I say it? Do you even know how smart I am in Spanish? And it's actually quite funny. <laughs> That's Gloria from, what's it, Modern Family? Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know it. I, I know it's popular, so yeah, I thought it was a great post. <laughs> it um, was, it was fabulous, especially yeah. if you know her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, okay, really very interesting. So in terms then of your recruitment process. I'd love to talk about that as well. One of the things I like to do is establish a career path in the interview process and learn what they really do well. Because the, again, the experience has taught me that my best development areas and everyone else's are their strengths, not their weaknesses. Doubling down on my weaknesses just makes me irritated more frequently and more often. So I'm very curious about that whole career pathing conversation that you have with candidates as they come through the process. So first off, our mentality is to rule people in and not rule people out. Um, if I look at myself before I was in a room such as Optimizely, I was a dummy in comparison to who I am now. 
And that was because I was never exposed to the right learnings, the right people, and I just wasn't given the opportunity. So we look for two key things, which are coachability. They have to be self-aware enough to know they're not perfect and they're probably shit at a lot of things because we all are. And being that self-aware is a superpower. So um, being, that, that, that thing. And, and being uh, vulnerable enough to admit it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, who are you trying to fool at the end of the day? Only probably yourself, right? So that's typically what I'll say to candidates when I see that they're not so coachable. They need a reality check and, that, and that's important. And a lot of them do a complete 180 throughout the program and it's, it's very cool to see. And then secondly, it's drive. What, what's their reason? What's their why? Why are they doing this? You need to have a good reason. It can be money. But money isn't the reason. Money is for your family. It's to buy the house. It's to buy the car. What, what's the reason? That's what we like to understand. Interesting. And the career path? Um, what do you mean, sorry? When I'm recruiting, I always like to say, okay, so in terms of how you see yourself developing, do you see yourself moving into a more senior SDR role, uh, moving into the field, uh, into management, maybe into a really difficult role like channel? How do you see yourself evolving? And what is it you do especially well? What do you love to do? Tell me about your best day at work in the last couple of years. What were you doing? Who were you doing it with? Your worst day at work. That's a great question that I'm going to steal. I've never asked that, so appreciate it. But So uh, from Marcus Buckingham. (laughs) Who's that? He wrote a fantastic book called The One Thing You Need to Know. Um, He was a former researcher from Gallup. And he's done some really interesting stuff around management. It's cool. Marcus Buckingham. Yeah. So wow. you might have heard of Gallup's 12 questions. I'll be honest, I haven't. But right. Very- Definitely look those up because um, the 12 questions determined great managers versus not great managers. And each of the three cluster, uh, sorry, clusters of three, so four clusters of three, is about a different evolutionary stage in terms of the manager's own evolution. But uh, what's really interesting is the number one question, uh, check out Project Oxygen also from Google. The number one quality of great managers was their people recommended joining the team to people they cared about. What was the second one? I'm just typing in the chat. Project Oxygen. Project Oxygen by Google, uh, from Google. Again, really interesting. I'm definitely going to check it out. I'm always looking for recommendations as to what to learn. Sorry, I completely lost where we were. Um, So career pathing, I'm interested in whether you set that up in the interview process or it happens in onboarding or it happens later. Yeah, so it depends on the candidate. Some are very defined in why they want to be an SDR, what their career path wants to look like. And those are usually strong candidates, typically. And, and they come through referrals from existing people in the space a lot of the time. We have candidates that don't know what they want to do yet. And it's not to say they can't be an amazing candidate in four weeks. That, that's the beauty of it. A lot of them are. As soon as they are inspired, they're a different person. But they've just never been inspired before, right? So I think what really helps is, for those candidates specifically, is getting people from all backgrounds um, and different levels within SAS onto the course to share their perspective. Because suddenly you hear about partnerships, suddenly you hear about SDR, then AE, and it builds a picture of what's possible. What we don't want is people who aren't looking to get into sales, right? It doesn't work out. That's not what we want. We want to re- weed that out as soon as possible. And sometimes I'll be, don't know if it's fair, but I think it's important to, 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 to look at the business in that way. Sometimes I'll ask questions like, okay, when they say, I just want to get into tech, I'll go, okay, great. There's so many options in tech. So do you want to be a developer? Do you want to be marketing? Do you want to be this, that? And uh, someone will say, oh, I want to be a developer. I want to be a marketer. I want to do this. I go, okay, well, fortunately, it's not for you then. It's a good qualifier. Yeah. Okay. This then raises a really interesting question because you put these people through what sounds like a phenomenally good experience and you equip them well. How do you make sure that they land in a place where the manager is capable of taking them on and helping them to continue that? Yeah. Well, that's a great question because that is the other 50%, right? Mm-hmm. Some would say it's more than 50%. It's more than life. 50%. That's the person who <laughs> determines their livelihood. <laughs> so we don't work with 
companies who are just building their SDR team if they haven't invested a significant amount in building that SDR team. So i.e. management, enablement, tech stack. We will work with you if you're hiring your first SDR team, but I want to meet with you or Omar has to meet with you and we have to really go through your numbers, check your understandings. Both Omar and I are credible SDR managers, so we're able to do the due diligence necessary there. We have had two managers who are really credible leave organizations and that's out of our control. And I'm currently thinking about how we get better at kind of assessing that, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. Well, one thing that you can do, which I found a really good indicator, is the motivational maps tool. Because if the motivations are not being met sufficiently, they become a flight risk. And it's a very useful uh, development tool because it enables you to focus your coaching around reminding them and uh, enabling those top motivators. Because people are motivated for their by their own, their own and they're not motivated by yours. Um, yeah. so if, if you know that and you understand their values, so that's another profile that's worth uh, exploring. It's a values profile from it, complete coherence. I hadn't heard of it. I think it's something we do naturally. But if we can processize it and document it and share it, then... And if you can use it with your people, then it tells you if there is a problem that you need to get ahead of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's foresight, right? We like foresight. I used to like surprises, but I'm not so keen on them now. I want nice and predictable. And my objective is to make my clients' lives boring. There's an exciting and tumultuous time to begin with as we go through that uh, process of transformation. But then it should be systematized and you know it's predictable it's clockwork okay one final question then before we wrap up i'm very interested in your views around competition compensation uh, measurement because i i see an awful lot of harmful unintended consequence because of how people are managed how they're paid how they're measured and I'd be very curious to get your take on it and what um, you've done to drive desirable behavior, both through the measurement and compensation, but also through culture, through values. Yeah, so first off, uh, this is maybe a bit of a do what I say and not as I've done. Not I'm going to say done um, instead of do. I believe that if you can find a scalable way to map compensation to what people's motivations are and have them design their own comp and make it realistic in their minds and motivating for them, then you should certainly do that. Have we done that internally? Not yet. We are in a position where we have an extremely motivated team and people are very happy with what they have. We pay very well, to be honest. The way we've kind of done it internally is I've brought everyone in. Everyone has equity in training, not share options, equity. And 10% of the company goes to future employees. But our current employees are not in that pool. They're, I've given them equity out of my pool. Not huge amounts, but and it's not guaranteed. It, they've got to do certain things to accrue it. But I want to give them more ownership mentality. Everyone who works for us works for us because they're massively bought into our mission. So Matt, our head of training, has always wanted to work as a head of training at a boot camp and was trying to become a head of training at a competitor's boot camp. And the moment I met him, I knew he was perfect. And it's just worked out phenomenally. Paula is very much motivated in the same way. She wants to help as many people as possible. She gets joy out of speaking to candidates and giving them offers. And that's the same for our head of recruitment, Jordan. So I, I could go on and on, but it'd be boring, right? A- the point is everyone is bought into why they're doing what they're doing. They all have their own mission within our mission, and it's very close to what we're doing. That's uh, How many and, people and have you lost over the last two years? So we've been operating for seven months, and right, uh, okay. we and you haven't lost so it. No, we, we we started in September. Yeah, Very interesting, yeah. excellent. So Sunil, tell me this: you you've got a golden ticket, and you can whisper in the ear of the idiot Sunil, age twenty three or thereabouts. What one choice bit of advice would you give him? I'm twenty five now, so I, I'm probably still learning <laughs> a lot. I almost certainly am learning a lot. Right? Well, maybe twenty one then. <laughs> yeah. I would say have a lot more confidence in your own abilities. And if I look at myself now and who I was in my first SDR role when I was like 21, um, I was, yeah, 21 in my first SDR role. I used to view one person particularly, won't mind me saying this, Henry, the top SDR on my team at the time, 
as a genius. And I was like, how do I be smart like Henry? How do I become as intelligent as Henry? And now I walk into any room and I feel that I am the best at what I know. Uh, I don't think I'm the smartest person in the room. I think I'm the smartest person at what I know. And that confidence has allowed me to do everything and more. So what surprised you most about this journey that you've gone through over the last seven months? I'll be honest, we did kind of write it out what we would achieve, myself and Omar, because that's future content that can be very, very cool to see. And we did predict a lot of it um, because we've seen it in other companies and how they've done it. And it is quite predictable when you dial it in. I think what surprised me the most is the fact that people are so bought into it, the fact that people genuinely want to help us. Like Benjamin Dennehy, you introduced me to, right? I spoke to him yesterday. I spent an hour on the phone with him. And he said, oh, can I post about your company? And I said, I'd love that. How much? He said, no, I just want to do it. That kind of reaction has surprised me. And it's very heartwarming, to be honest. That's fantastic. So, um, Sunil, how can people get a hold of you? So best way is LinkedIn, but I do get swamped on LinkedIn. So it might take me a few days to respond, but I always will. Reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, my email is sunil at trainio.com, but I don't respond to many emails that often unless it's a client. And even then, sometimes I miss it, which is absolutely terrible. I need to get better at that. So, Well, um, I get 500 a day, so I'm with you. It's yeah. a, I hate email at the moment. Yeah. Okay, so are you hiring? We are hiring continuously for our boot camp. We have nine full-time staff after starting seven months ago, a very high wages. So um, we have a cost base that we need to make sure we're um, protecting and we'll probably be hiring again Q4. Excellent. So who are you looking for at the moment? We're not looking to hire anyone at the moment, but what 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 we'd ideally look for are people who are looking to transition into SaaS sales as an SDR. You have to have no previous experience, background or education. And we're also looking to work with companies that are hiring SDRs at the moment and would like a source that is vetted, that they can rely on, so they actually know the SDRs have already been trained, are going to work out, and are diverse. We can provide that service. And it costs £5,500. Um, and when you consider that our competitors who are recruiters are charging eight or £9,000 for an untrained graduate who I once hired as an SDR manager a bunch of times, and half the time they work, half the time they don't. We've placed 50 people since September. Um, only one of them has not worked out. Um, and that is an error on our half. And the, co- well, the company didn't say that. They said we both should have spotted it. But we have very high success rates. Our SDRs are outperforming the people in their current teams consistently. Yeah. Fantastic. Sunil, thank you. Thank you. This is Marcus Cappy signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you found this insightful and useful, then please do like, comment, share, and tag someone who would benefit. And if you know someone who's looking to transition, do get in touch with Sunil and check out Trainio. In the meantime, if you want to get hold of me, my email is marcus at laughs-last.com. I am hiring at the moment. So if you know of anyone who is a good, solid enterprise salesperson selling into large organizations with 30,000 plus headcount, those are the sorts of folk I would love to have a chat with don't necessarily need that experience, but they do need to have a track record of selling 100k plus deals. In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.